Americas. Uh, today we have uh, our lecturer, Kiel Gwiltz. Uh, he's, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, he's an early career scientist and uh, affiliated to the Script Institute of Oceanography. From the background, he is a mathematician and made a master degree in uh, applied mathematics. As, uh, uh, and uh, he is uh, dealing with the numerical analysis, modeling, uh, the data simulation, particularly in geomagnetism. And today we will hear this, uh, his progress together with uh, uh, his colleagues uh, in area of uh, data simulation in geomagnetism. Gil, please, uh, now is your time to start the lecture. Thank you. All right, thanks. So, let's see, am I, can you see my screen? Yes. I okay, can. perfect, perfect. All right, yeah, so, so thanks for that. And, uh, and um, thanks to everybody for coming. Thanks to the, to the organizers. Uh, I've enjoyed, uh, as you said at the beginning, uh, good morning to everyone over here in the States. Uh, I've enjoyed the last week and a half. Unfortunately, I, you know, a lot of these, the, the early sessions are in the middle of the night for me, but uh, the, these sessions at the end of the day are at about eight o'clock in the morning out here. So I've, I've enjoyed for the last week and a half getting up every day and <clears throat> starting with a cup of coffee and one of these nice talks. So I'm, I'm, I'm sad that this is almost over, um, but it's been, it's been a lot of fun, a lot of interesting stuff. So I, uh, I want to start out by uh, just saying a little bit about some of the other people that I've, I've worked with on this stuff. So uh, as Alik said, I'm gonna talk about geomagnetism in particular and, and data assimilation. And so this is just something I've had an interest in for, for a few years now, um, but really it's uh, Weijia Kuang and Andy Tangborn that have been working on this for a long time, for over 10 years now. And uh, Weijia Kuang is out at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center uh, that's out near Washington, DC. And Andy Tangborn, uh, for a long time, he's now at NOAA, but he was uh, affiliated with UMBC. It's a university that's also out in that area, uh, uh, but also he, he was working at, at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center as well. And they were, they were nice enough to um, invite myself and my advisor, Matthias Morsfeld, uh, to, uh, to come on board with them and, and start thinking about these things that I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about today. All right, so this is roughly how it's going to go, or hopefully how it's going to go. Uh, I want to start out by explaining, you know, exactly what I mean by the by the title of this talk: predicting secular variation in the magnetic field uh, and with data assimilation. So we'll start out by uh, getting on the same page and and making it clear what what part of the magnetic field we're actually interested in and and why we care about it. And then from there, we'll be able to talk about uh, the observations we have of the magnetic field that are going to be relevant and, and the numerical models. And then from there, we'll be able to actually get into some results and some, some of the, the challenges uh, that we see in this work. Okay, so the magnetic field that we're interested in is sometimes called the core magnetic field or the main magnetic field. This is the field that's generated in the outer core of the planet. So this is this nice illustration from the European Space Agency. And so you see the, the solid inner core of the planet and then the, the liquid outer core, right? So this starts about 3000 kilometers below the surface of the earth, below our feet. And it's made up of mostly iron and, and some nickel. But the important thing is that it's uh, convecting. Uh, it's, it's undergoing turbulent convection and it's electrically conducting. Okay, so uh, this is what generates the typically dipole dominated field that they're trying to illustrate here, right? So this is the field that uh, makes your compass point, uh, point roughly towards the uh, geographic poles, uh, but certainly not exactly, right? Uh, the field 
protects protects the earth and the surrounding area from from the wind. So you have you have charged particles that come off of the the sun, uh, or also from from outside the solar system, cosmic rays, and and this radiation tends to get trapped by the magnetic field of the earth. And oftentimes it's, it's directed towards the magnetic poles. And that's actually uh, what's responsible for, for the auroras. I don't know if we have any people that are at latitudes where they're, they're able to see those. I've, I've never seen them in, in person myself. Um, so over here uh, on this plot in the upper right, this is a map of the magnetic field intensity at the surface of the planet, and I think back in, I think from 2008, uh, sometime within the last last 20 years. Uh, don't worry about the white dots for now, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so I said this is a dipole dominated field. Um, that's you know why it's been able to be used in the past for things like navigation. But uh, you can see from this picture that it's not, it's certainly not a perfect dipole. You don't have something that's just symmetric about the equator, uh, you know, is there's these interesting features there. You, you see uh, the red spots here where there's a high intensity near the poles, and that is because of the, the, the dipole, and there's a lot of flux there. Uh, but then you also see, uh, you know, these, these sort of lobes of intensity. And then maybe the feature that stands out the most here is you have this blue spot in the middle of this intensity map that's at the, the low end of the intensity spectrum here. So, so the red is about 70,000 nanotesla and blue is, is something like 20,000 nanotesla, right? And you can see that that's actually uh, about half of the intensity uh, of the field at, at equivalent latitudes elsewhere. The green is about 40,000 nanotesla. So this blue region uh, is, is usually called the South Atlantic anomaly, this weak spot in the field. Okay, the white spots, what those are, are actually locations where a particular satellite, uh, the Topex satellite, I, I think it was measuring, uh, it was something with oceanography, I can't remember, sea surface height, uh, something like that. But the white spots are where that satellite experienced instrumentation failure, had trouble with its electronics. Okay? And you can see pretty clearly that those failures are, are clustered around the, the South Atlantic anomaly. Okay? And this is because you have this weak spot in the field and things like the solar wind uh, penetrate further uh, into, the, into the overall field, they get closer to the earth and uh, it's much easier for, for that to start interfering with electronics on board satellites. And this isn't an issue that was unique to this Topex satellite. This is, this is a persistent problem with instruments on satellites. They pass through the South Atlantic anomaly and they're much more prone to having, having issues and sometimes very serious issues. They've had uh, 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 catastrophic failures of, of electronic systems on board satellites. So they've been permanently damaged by, by the radiation out there. Uh, and then people also, you know, it's something that's often repeated this, this uh, I say, you know, the, the field protects the, the earth from the solar wind. Uh, sometimes you'll hear people talk about it protecting the, the atmosphere of the planet. Right? There's, there's this, been this thought for a long time that the solar wind uh, in the absence of a magnetic field would strip away the atmosphere of the planet. Uh, and so a magnetic field maybe is, is necessary for a planet to be habitable. And people point to Mars as an example of a planet where it once had a magnetic field like the Earth and it's since died out. And of course, now much of the atmosphere has been stripped away. It's a very thin atmosphere on Mars. Um, that's something that's a little more uh, recently. Some people have objected to that idea and say maybe it's maybe it's not the maybe it's not the case. Um, but uh, but that's something you'll hear people say sometimes. But of course, a, a classic the classic application uh, or use of the magnetic field that. Uh, we're probably all familiar with is in navigation and, and surveying. And so this is, uh, uh, this image shows a declination of the field uh, at, at present. This is from a, the IGRF, it's the International Geomagnetic Reference Field. So they, they release this every five years, a map of the current state of the magnetic field. And the declination is just 
you know, how far off from, from geographic north, say your compass would be. So out here in California, where I am, uh, my compass would be about 10 degrees off, say from true north. All right, so uh, this magnetic field now, I've shown you these pictures of it, um, and it's got some of these interesting features like the South Atlantic anomaly. Uh, the deal is that changes over time, and it changes on a variety of different time scales. So on decadal time scales, uh, you get some, some changes in the, in the morphology of the field. The, the weak spots and strong spots sort of grow and, and move. And for example, the, the uh, magnetic poles move around. Um, and sometimes this is something you'll see in, the, see in the news. Sometimes they'll talk about, oh, the, the magnetic North Pole moved uh, you know, 30 kilometers over the last year. And this is actually an illustration uh, from data over the last 400 years, uh, the, the Northern Pole as it, as it moves around. This is an illustration from uh, NOAA Actually, the speaker at the end of the day yesterday was from, from NOAA. Um, so this is a, I have to apologize, this is a US government agency. So, uh, so of course the, the, the picture here is, is centered on, on North America, but I, I promise that most of this will take a, a more global perspective of the, of the field. And then on, on longer time scales, the field undergoes these really dramatic changes uh, where the polarity of the field can completely reverse. Okay, so, so the northern magnetic pole uh, and the southern magnetic pole switch, right? This has happened several times throughout Earth's history. And this down here is actually uh, an illustration of you know, what's called the virtual axial dipole moment. I don't want to get caught up in, in the details of what that is, but just just think of it as, as roughly a representation of how strong the, the dipole field is at a given time. And this is that intensity, the dipole intensity over the last 2 million years uh, with present day at the right and 2 million years ago at the left. And then uh, the sign indicates the polarity. Okay, so you can see, for example, on this plot that back here at about 780,000 years ago, we had the most recent reversal. Uh, and actually we had a handful of these in the last 2 million years. And uh, roughly over the last something like 20 million years, we've averaged one of these every, every 250,000 years or so. Right? So it's, it's not an uncommon thing in the history of the Earth. All right. So, uh, what is it we're actually going to try and do here? Uh, what's what's going to be the point of this work? Uh, so there are two main objectives. Uh, we're interested in estimating the dynamic state of this geodynamo system. So that means uh, not just the, the magnetic field and what it looks like, but also uh, the fluid flow in the outer core. So this is uh, an image from a simulation, actually, of a, a dynamo model. At, at NASA, and on the left here, they're showing a, a single magnetic field line from, from their model. And on the right, this is a streamline for, for a flow in the, in the inside of the outer core. All right, so, so the, the red sphere in here is, is the solid inner core, and the outer sphere is just not the surface of the Earth. This is just uh, the, the outer core of the planet, the, the fluid here. And so I, I show this now just to make it clear that while we see this nice dipole dominated field out here towards the surface and uh, from observations up in space, you can see the magnetic field down in the outer core, uh, at least according to simulations, is actually uh, very, very messy. And similarly, the, the fluid flow in the outer core is, is very turbulent and messy. And so we'd like to get an estimate of, of the state of the system. And then you'd like to be able to, as I said, the, the field changes, you'd like to be able to use that information to, to make forecasts of how the field's going to change uh, on decadal scales. You'd like to project what the field looks like 5, 10, 50 years into the future. And so uh, I'll, I'll show some results on that later. This is just a little teaser right here. This is uh, from a recently produced forecast from the system at NASA. 
It shows the field intensity or projected field intensity in 2025. Uh, and you have some, some contour lines here for that South Atlanta anomaly. And so these are the main goals there. There are many other reasons to be interested in this, but I think this is the, the easiest way to frame this, estimate the state of the geodynamo and try and produce good forecasts of the magnetic field going forward. And uh, to achieve those things, uh, we'll look into using data assimilation. All right, so, so now we're all on the same page, hopefully, uh, and we can talk a little bit about exactly what observations are available to us and what sort of numerical models we have. And then I'll just briefly review the aspects of data assimilation that, that we need to have just, just for the discussion of this, this problem. Okay, so uh, you know, I, I just showed you a bunch of figures about the current state of the magnetic field and uh, the magnetic field even in the distant past, uh, the reversals it's undergone, but how do I, how do I know all this stuff? So the observations actually come from a variety of different sources. Uh, certainly in, in modern times, you have satellite-based observations of the magnetic field. So this in the upper right is a, a illustration from ESA of SWARM. It's a collection of three satellites that have magnetometers on them and, and measure the magnetic field of the planet. And there have been a couple other missions similar to this. Um, over the last two decades that have done the same thing. So for a couple of decades now, we've had satellite-based measurements of the magnetic field. And of course, there have also been, since the mid 1800s, there have been terrestrial-based observation stations. Uh, but then to learn about the field before those days, people have come up with a lot of, a lot of creative ways uh, to get an idea of what the past field looked like. So uh, in terms of those reversals, uh, in the distant past, we know about those things from uh, paleomagnetic reconstructions, uh, paleomagnetism people. They go and look at uh, magnetic material and igneous rocks, right? They look at rocks that have cooled down slowly over time in the past and frozen in the signal of the, of the magnetic field. Uh, so they do things like this is an illustration of uh, mid-ocean ridge where you have this upwelling magma, right? And then it comes to the surface, the ocean floor, and it slowly cools off and the seafloor spreads out. And as it cools off, the ferromagnetic material in there uh, sort of freezes in the, the signal of the magnetic field, right? So, so this illustration is just showing from uh, something like the 5 million years in the past, say up till the present, uh, and the colored regions represent areas where you'd have present day magnetic polarity and, and white the reverse, right? So you get from these mid-ocean ridges as you go out sort of a, a recording of, of the polarity of the, of the dynamo. And so people will go out with boats and drag magnetometers behind the boat and, and read, this, read this barcode signal of the, of the history of the polarity of the dynamo. And this is all, I'm making it all sound really simple. This is a whole complicated inverse problem on its own that people people make whole whole careers out of. Uh, it's it's not as easy as I'm making it sound. And then uh, people have done other uh, really creative things. There's archaeomagnetic reconstructions where they've gone back and and looked at, um, for example, material in in pottery and and bricks and things like that over the last few thousand years to get an idea of what the field looked like. And then uh, for the last few hundred years, they've even, they've even gone back and looked at ship sailing logs. Somebody's uh, meticulously gone through compass, recorded compass readings from ship sailing logs over the last 400 years. And that's actually how we know some of what we know about that South Atlantic anomaly and that it's been around for at least a, at least a few hundred years. Okay, uh, now if you just take, uh, in the present day, if you go and you just take a measurement of the magnetic field, if I sit here with a magnetometer and I measure the field, or you have a swarm satellites in orbit and they measure the magnetic field, you, um, of course, measure a lot more than just the field of the geodynamo, as, as I'm sure a lot of people here know better than I do. Uh, there are a number of magnetic sources on this 
planet other than the other than the outer core. Um, and so this this illustration from ESA <clears throat> highlights some of those. So this on the right here is a cross section of the planet. And so you have down here the solid inner core and the fluid core that's the geodynamo in red. And that's what we're, we're gonna be interested in here. But of course, you also have currents in the mantle and uh, currents out in the ocean, the ionosphere, um, and up in the magnetosphere. And, and all of these things are influencing any measurement you make. And so what they show on the left here uh, tries to illustrate the, the various contributions from these different sources. Okay, so this is on the vertical axis, the magnetic field strength, and each of these oval shapes represents a different, different source. Uh, so this, this narrow red one here is labeled long-term dynamo processes. So that's, that's what we're really interested in. And on the horizontal axis, uh, don't worry about the, uh, this description on the bottom right now, just focus on this. Uh, this is spatial wavelength. So, so this is really just about the size of the feature that you're looking at. Okay, so uh, this is on a log scale. These, these axes are both on a log scale here. So over here are large, on the left-hand side are large length scale features. And so over here, this long-term dynamo processes, that's uh, almost two orders of magnitude larger than, than uh, the next strongest source, okay? So, so the point is, is really big features of the magnetic field that's, that's almost exclusively when you make a measurement, the signal of the, of the geodynamo. So this is why over here, this is, this is, for example, the dipole over here, this large length scale feature, the big dipole dominated field we see. This is why you're able to use this. This is why you can, you know, with just a compass, you, could, you can see the signal of the dipole because it's this large length scale feature is uh, very dominant over these other sources. But when you start getting into small, uh, magnetic anomalies, small scale magnetic anomalies uh, of say a hundred kilometers, a few hundred kilometers or less, um, then you're, it's things are starting to get messy. A lot of other things can be influencing that. Okay, so uh, I should say there's going to be, uh, you know, there'll be a couple of equations along the way here, uh, and I put them up for for people that are interested in these things, but I think you know, we'll be able to have uh, a largely conceptual discussion uh, about the about the issues that are that are of interest here, and um, and avoid getting bogged down in any 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 details. So, uh, but this is going to be important to understanding the problem. So, what happens when they take these measurements of the magnetic field from a satellite or a terrestrial observation station, say? is you typically assume that where you've taken the measurement, you're in uh, a source-free region. You're in a region without, without any currents, okay? And when that's the case, then the observed magnetic field B here can actually just be defined as uh, by a potential field. It can be defined as, as the gradient of uh, some scalar field. If you do that, you can actually describe this scalar field, this potential V in terms of what are called spherical harmonics. So if you're not familiar with spherical harmonics, uh, that's fine. I'll, I'll tell you just basically what you need to know. Uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with Fourier series, um, it's, it's the same idea, but, but on the surface of a, of a sphere, say. Right, the idea is just that you, you break down the scalar function into into pieces into component parts, okay? Uh, so for example, uh, I have this illustration down here at the bottom on the right-hand side. If I had this function on the surface of a sphere here, the scalar function on the right, uh, I could break this down. I could describe this in spherical harmonics as the sum of this function. So this P here is just, it's what's called the uh, associated Legendre polynomial. That, uh, so it's just some function of, of theta uh, of the meridional angle on the sphere, okay? 
And so this could just be written as the sum of this function and this function, right? And so you just have these, these coefficients here that are called Gauss coefficients, G and H. And they just tell you how much of each of these ingredients you need, uh, each of these little functions you need to add together to get the scalar function you're interested in. Okay. So this is going to be uh, this is just going to be an important component of, of this problem, and I'll, I'll explain explain why on the next slide. Okay. But so basically, the idea is you describe the magnetic field. Uh, not by just saying at this point it's pointing in this direction with this intensity. You actually have a potential that defines it, and you describe that potential as uh, a list of these these Gauss coefficients, a list of how much of each ingredient you need to to make the field in terms of spherical harmonics. Okay, so why do they do this? Um, it goes back to the the plot about the contribution of different sources that I showed a couple of slides ago. So it's widely believed that uh, the large scale features, uh, as I showed in that plot, are really the signal of the geodynamo. And I should say uh, this index L here in that formula I was showing for the spherical harmonics, that really corresponds to, to length scale. So the lower that L is, the, in general, the, the bigger the feature is you're talking about, okay? So for example, uh, that G L equals one, M equals zero here, that coefficient actually is what gives you the dipole. That's the dipole ingredient, right? The bigger that coefficient G uh, one zero, the, the, the bigger, the stronger your dipole is. And as you move to larger values of L, you get the, the finer scale features. And so the stuff up to degree 14, that's, that's believed to be the dynamo. So the, the point of all this is by describing the field that we observe uh, in this way, it, it helps you isolate the signal of the dynamo. And I, and I should say that this other stuff here, we don't need to worry about it, but A is just, that's the, the radius of the surface of the earth. And then, then R is gonna be, um, just, just where you're at, the distance from the center of the Earth. So, so once you have a description of the magnetic field that looks like this uh, from your observations at the surface, under certain assumptions, you can, you can downward continue that. You can take your measurements at the surface and get an idea of what the field looks like down at the boundary of the geodynamo, so down, down near the core mantle boundary. And so that's what this, this video is showing right here. So you have the radial component of the field at the surface, and you see this largely this dipole-dominated field, uh, you know, in the tens of thousands of, of nano Tesla range. And then when you use this setup and you downward continue it, look at it. What does the field look like at the core mantle boundary? You get intensities that are about an order of magnitude higher, and you also see that all these sort of fine scale features here are, are less smoothed out. Now you see a lot more, a lot more activity, a lot more stuff going on that you can't see out of the surface. So, uh, you know, I go to the trouble of explaining all this uh, because it's actually these low degree spherical harmonics, it's these spherical harmonics that are actually used in assimilation systems. These are the things that will actually assimilate into models of the geodynamo to try and estimate the state of the magnetic field and the core flow in, in the interior, okay? And so th this is an important aspect of this problem because uh, assimilating these spherical harmonics actually uh, causes, it causes a lot of issues. There are a lot of issues associated with this. All right, so I told you about the observations. Um, and what sort of models do we have available to us? So I don't think uh, we're gonna have a chance to really get into this, but I thought it was worth mentioning that there are, there are these simple low dimensional models that try and recreate the behavior of the dipole over time. And this is a simulation from one of them. So the idea here is this is just supposed to look like that plot I showed earlier of the previous 2 million years where you see the, the intensity of the dipole varies for a while and then you get these reversals where it changes polarity. That's, that's what this is simulating. 
There are big 3D numerical models of the dynamo system that simulate the fluid flow in the outer core and its coupling to the magnetic field. And those have been around since the mid 90s. Uh, the very first one was built by Gary Glatzmeyer. And this is actually a snapshot of one of his models. Uh, these are the magnetic field lines. And again, like the simulation I showed earlier uh, from the NASA model, you can see that you know, away from the magnetic field, you get your nice dipole dominated field. Uh, but down, down near the, in the outer core, near the core mantle boundary, uh, the lines get all twisted. It's very messy. And in fact, this, uh, these snapshots right here are showing this simulation undergoing a, one of these reversals. So actually, if you run these models in the right parameter regime and you run them for long enough, you'll, you'll get this, this sort of reversing behavior out of them. You can see these sorts of things happen. Uh, this is another thing I, I don't think we'll really need to talk about, but I, I think it's uh, so interesting that it's worth mentioning. People usually find this interesting. There have been uh, multiple attempts to simulate this sort of system in a laboratory. And there are, uh, there are several labs around the world that have done this, or I shouldn't say several, but maybe something like on the order of 10 or something like that. Uh, the one I'm most familiar with is out at the University of Maryland. So that's near Washington, DC. Uh, and the lab's run by this physicist, Dan Lathrop. And uh, this is a picture of their system uh, so this is actually, this steel drum here is, is three meters in diameter. It's not a small thing. And then inside of this, they have, a, they have a, another sphere that's supposed to be like the inner core of the planet. And they can rotate the outer and inner sphere uh, at different rates. And then they fill this thing with liquid sodium. And they start spinning it around and they apply a magnetic field to it. And they, they watch how the field lines get all... Uh, contorted and everything and and amplified by the by the flow inside and it's actually if you don't if you don't know liquid sodium is uh, is uh, can be pretty it, it can be pretty dangerous stuff it's uh, you know reacts violently with water and things so they have to I, I just went to a talk uh, recently actually given by by um, by Dan Lathrop where um, he talked about they wanted to they wanted to make some modifications to the interior of this experiment, and uh, so disassembling it all and, and cleaning it out and and storing the liquid sodium and all that is it is a very precarious uh, process. So there's a pretty serious about safety there, but it, it's an interesting thing. But anyway, we'll focus on these uh, these numerical dynamo models. So let me tell you a little bit about about those. And again, this will be this will be a place where I have a few equations, but we don't need to uh, we don't really need to get bogged down in them. I just like to point out a, a few things and discuss discuss them conceptually. Okay, so uh, there are different ways to to simulate this, but a pretty typical way, the way the the Dynamo model at NASA works, um, is it relies on 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 these three equations. Uh, so this top equation here is just a uh, usual Navier-Stokes equation, okay, for the, for the fluid flow V in the outer core with some rotation effects. So the rotation of the planet is a, is a critical piece of the generation of the magnetic field. Um, and then it's, it's driven by, by buoyancy. So you have some density perturbation controlled by this equation. So that you get, uh, so that you get the buoyancy, you get upwelling inside of the dynamo uh, uh, that's then twisted around by by the rotation in complicated ways. Uh, but the main modification, if if you're not familiar with, uh, you would call this magnetohydrodynamics or MHD, right? So the uh, uh, the physics of uh, when you have a fluid like this moving around that's electrically conducting. Uh, Basically, to, to oversimplify it, uh, you just have a typical fluid flow, but with the addition of a Lorentz force term. That's what this is. This J here is just the current density in the fluid. So you have a usual uh, fluid flow in the outer core, uh, 
but you, you also have a, a Lorentz force. Uh, so, so the magnetic field is able to influence the, the fluid flow in the outer core. Uh, one thing I'll come back to later is that these, these models are, are pretty computationally expensive. They're not, they're not simple things. Um, I wanna say a few more things about the, the middle equation here that, that governs the, the evolution of the magnetic field, uh, the so-called induction equation. This is something that actually just falls out of, uh, under certain scalings, falls out of, out of Maxwell's equations. And really what you have here is just uh, induction. You have, the, you have the fluid, this conducting fluid that moves around in the magnetic field. And so you, you induce new magnetic fields. Uh, and then you also have some, some decay of the magnetic field, some transfer of magnetic energy to, to kinematic, right? And so that's actually uh, this, this video over here on the right uh, what's being illustrated here is over the course of a simulation, uh, the net energy change from uh, kinematic to magnetic, that's in yellow. And then conversely, the conversion of, of uh, magnetic energy by, by ohmic dissipation. Okay. And uh, so, so the point of showing this is just, again, you can see you, can see you have a uh, pretty complicated pattern in the outer core of, of magnetic field generation and, and decay. Uh, the other thing we're gonna need to understand about this is that when you, when you do one of these dynamo models, you typically decompose the magnetic field into two scalar fields. So this would be called a toroidal and poloidal decomposition. And the only thing you need to know here uh, is that you, you do this uh, with the models and then you describe these scalars in those spherical harmonics. So you describe them the same way uh, that I discussed describing the, the observations. And then it's actually uh, the spherical harmonics that describe uh, this scalar field here, P, that, that uh, we have the observations of. That's, that's what we're going to assimilate. And the other aspects of the field, the other aspects of the, of the dynamo model, so the fluid flow and the outer core and then density perturbations are, are similarly described in spherical harmonics. So, so the thing to take away from all this uh, that's gonna be important is, you know, we have a description of the state of the geodynamo and a description of some observations in the magnetic field from the geodynamo. And all of those things are described by spherical harmonic coefficients. So they're not, they're not described by saying this is what the direction and, and intensity of the field is at a certain point, or this is what the velocity looks like. It's, it's described in this, in this spectral way. And this is, as I said before, this is going to be important because it, it, it causes some issues in doing the, the assimilations. Okay, so we have these we have these observations of the magnetic field, uh, but there's a lot of things we can't observe like the fluid flow or the magnetic field in the interior. We have numerical models of the system. We have these numerical geodynamo models. And so obviously a natural thing to do then is to try and merge these things through, through data assimilation. Okay. So this, uh, this is going to be a brief review, I guess, of data assimilation. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because uh, I know we've already we've already seen this a couple of times this week. Uh, I just want to use it to again highlight uh, an important part of this problem. So let's just say that X represents the state of the system and Y my observations, right? So X is the state of the geodynamo. And why is, is this collection of observations of the magnetic field? Uh, and, you know, in the usual way, you assume that these, these are related by, by some observation operator and that there, there's some noise. You don't have perfect measurements of the system. And of course, the whole goal, as we've, as we've seen and discussed this week then in data assimilation is really to describe the, the posterior distribution here the distribution of the, of the true state conditioned on, on your observations. And so what I wanna emphasize uh, again, is that in this problem, 
that X here, the, the description of the state is a collection of spherical harmonic coefficients. It's, it's not uh, explicit descriptions of, of the velocity or magnetic field uh, directly. And similarly, this Y here, as those, those observations in the form of spherical harmonic coefficients. Okay, so, so this whole distribution is a distribution over uh, collections of spherical harmonic coefficients. And then a lot of the, of the currently operational geomagnetic DA systems um, uh, use ensemble-based methods, uh, including the, the one at, at NASA that I'll, I'll spend some time talking about. So uh, I think this is this is going to be the last the last bit of, of equations here that we need. And again, we won't get bogged down in them. I just want to focus on a few conceptual things. Uh, so as a reminder, with ensemble-based DA, like an ensemble Kalman filter, that's that's going to be what the, the NASA system uses. Uh, the idea, right, is that you have an ensemble of of simulations you're running simultaneously of multiple instances of the model. So in this case, multiple instances of the, of the geodynamo model. And here I have a little cartoon of this setup, right? So you have some observed states and some unobserved states and simulations correspond to a particular color, right? So there's a, there's a blue simulation and a yellow and a green and a, and a purple here, right? And so you run, you run your simulations or collection of simulations, your ensemble, up until a time where you have some information, uh, in this case, these observations of the magnetic field. So it would be like this red dot here uh, with some associated uncertainty indicated by these, these error bars. And then you use your, your preferred scheme, DA scheme, right, to, to adjust your estimate of both the observed and the unobserved state. Right, and the important thing in the ensemble-based assimilations is that the way you decide how much to adjust your unobserved state, right, based on the, the state you do have observations of is, is by the ensemble statistics. So you compute the covariance of your ensemble. You look at how, how say in this cartoon example, how at this time is the observed state correlated to the unobserved state according to your ensemble. Right. And then you make your adjustment to the observed state and, and the unobserved one, right? So, so this, this would be like in our problem, the equivalent of, I have this observation of magnetic field, uh, but I don't know what the, the fluid flow in the outer core looks like. So how do I, how do I adjust that fluid flow according to, according to what I see in the magnetic field? Okay. Uh, and so this, again, we, we don't need to get we, we don't really need to, to talk about this. I know we've talked about, we've seen the Kalman filter at least a, a couple of times over the last, last week and a half. So this is just the particular methodology uh, that's used. But uh, the important thing here is really just uh, that we're gonna come back to is this issue of, of getting statistics from, from the ensemble to see how things are correlated, okay? And so, as I said, uh, a lot of these, the NASA system and several other geomagnetic DA systems like it are currently using ensemble Kalman filters. And as I said, we're, we're gonna come back to this. I'll just say right now uh, to, to foreshadow what the, what the issue is, uh, realize, as I've said several times, this, this X here, it's a collection of spherical harmonic coefficients, right? So, this ensemble covariance is a collection of covariances between spherical harmonic coefficients. Uh, you're, it's telling you how these coefficients are correlated. And so that, that creates some, some interesting problems. Okay. All right, I think that's probably a, a natural, we take a break at 45 minutes. So that's probably a natural place uh, to go ahead and do that, if that's okay. Absolutely, that's okay, fine. Okay, that's perfect. Good. Yeah, thank you. Then it's able to uh, reconvene and so at uh, five fifty-five. Correct. Perfect. Yeah, local time. Yeah. <laughs>